All right, here we go. Just give it a couple minutes for everyone to show up. We have 18 participants already. Give a few minutes for everyone to get here. Love to hear where everyone's from in the chat if you want to pop that in. Okay, great. I think we should get going because we know everybody has a busy day. Uh, Thomas, why don't you uh, take it away, introduce everyone. Uh, and uh, during the talk, we will have time for Q&A later. So please, everyone, pop your questions anytime into the chat. Uh, we'll be, I'll either save them or somebody will pop on and answer in the chat. So um, I'm really excited to hear everybody talk and um, take it away, Thomas. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome. My name is Thomas. I work with Veterinarians Without Borders as a uh, program officer for volunteer recruitment and mobilization. So we're very happy to have you on the call today um, and equally excited to have uh, newly returned young volunteers with us to share about their experience in Ghana, Kenya, and Cambodia. So we have Diane, Vanessa, Christina, and Alana on the call today and uh, looking forward to hearing more from them shortly. Uh, as was noted, there will be a question and answer period. So some of you on the webinar might be interested in learning more about uh, BWB's Young Volunteer Program, or you might be interested to learn more about our international work in general. So if you have any questions that come up throughout, please capture those in the chat and we'll try to get to those. Uh, I also want to take just a moment to acknowledge the land that I live and work on. I live here just outside of St. John uh, in New Brunswick, uh, the home of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy First Nation. Uh, my home would be closer to the Passamaquoddy First Nation uh, territory here. So I acknowledge that I live and work um, on this territory. I'd like to turn it over now to my colleague, Katie Clark, who will share a little bit about uh, Vets Without Borders more broadly and our international volunteer sending program as well. Over to you, Katie. Hi, thanks, Thomas. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And a big thank you to our volunteers uh, for coming back and, uh, and being available here to share their stories and to work with our partners. Um, as Thomas mentioned, I am the Asia Program Manager for Veterinarians Without Borders, uh, and I have the great privilege to be able to work with our partners and our volunteers through our Volunteers Engaged in Gender Responsive Technical Solutions Program, so what we fondly refer to as VETS because that's a mouthful. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about VWB and our program um, before we hand it over to our volunteers so they can tell you about uh, what it's like being a volunteer uh, with our programs. Uh, okay. So our, um, the Veterinarians Without Borders uh, started in 2005 um, by uh, a number of veterinarians uh, from the University of Guelph uh, who were really interested in making sure that um, animal health services uh, were able to be provided to communities that would otherwise not be able to 
uh, have access to those animal health services. And from there, it has grown beyond just uh, our volunteer board to have a, a full staff with uh, international programming funded through Global Affairs Canada uh, and through some of our fantastic uh, donors as well. Uh, uh, but we still have that main mandate of working with our volunteers in order to build capacity uh, of our partners uh, and, and to be able to share and learn from each other uh, in order to have stronger animal health uh, services and one health uh, approach that can be implemented across Canada as well as around the world and the communities that we work with. Um, so we talk about ensuring uh, better live livelihood conditions for some of the most vulnerable populations, um, promoting food and nutrition security and food safety through veterinarian care and knowledge, uh, and supporting agroecological agro production models, promoting healthy and sustainable relationships between humans, animals, and their environment. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about One Health. Um, in order to do that, we work with smallholder farmers, um, as well as uh, developing community animal health workers, volunteers um, that work within the community be able to be able to provide additional animal health services that veterinarian or extension workers um, wouldn't necessarily be able to get to on a regular basis, uh, as well as working with our local partners um, and developing their capacity to deliver stronger, more sustainable, uh, and gender responsive programming. Um, so through that is our One Health program programming, which is improving community health and equitable One Health empowerment for poor and marginalized women in rural areas uh, with a high prevalence of zoonotic disease. Um, and we're also looking to strengthen capacity of communities to prevent, detect, and respond to prevalent zoonotic disease working in local coordination with the other authorities uh, in the, the region in order to do referral and reporting um, with government uh, and municipal um, actors, as well as increasing access to resources that are needed to be able to prevent, detect, and respond. So that could be improving wash infrastructure, providing uh, vaccinations, as well as supporting general animal health care. Um, and that's what uh, our VETS program is doing in a number, working with a number of our uh, partners. So we started this program, uh, which is generously funded through Global Affairs Canada um, in 2020, which was a challenge uh, to start a volunteer sending program in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and we are working in six different countries, uh, but we've been able to adapt with and work with our partners to be able to engage both Canadian volunteers where possible and it's been awesome this year to be able to actually send some to the field as well as working with uh, with national volunteers as well so through this program which is usually um, you know placements between three weeks uh, and could be up to uh, two years in some cases uh, we have been able to support over 60,000 beneficiaries. Uh, so that's community members, that's um, uh, local NGO staff members. They're uh, also government extension workers uh, and uh, being able to provide additional training um, and resources where available. We've recruited up to 47 volunteers. 15 of those have been uh, Canadians uh, that we've been able to deploy into the field. Seven have provided remote support, uh, and we've had another 25 national volunteers that have been working within their, uh, their own communities, which is an amazing opportunity for us to be able to collaborate Canadian expertise as well as local expertise. Um, we work with nine fantastic partners in the six different countries, so Ghana, Kenya, Senegal, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, and so our partners in Ghana are SEND and GAPNAT. In Kenya, we're working with two dairy unions, uh, the Meru uh, Union for Dairy Cooperatives and the Wakaluma Dairy Limited. In Senegal, we work with AVSF, which is the VWB in France, and they have offices in uh, regional offices in Cambodia and Senegal. Uh, in uh, Laos PDR, PDR, we're working with Health Poverty Action and Care. Uh, and in Vietnam, we work with the Institute of Environmental Health and Sustainable Development. So it's been an amazing program. Um, we're only um, 
three years, well, two and a half years in now. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to work with our volunteers and to be able to uh, continue to develop and deliver this program in the middle of a very challenging time um, for our partners, uh, for our community members, and for our volunteers. So I'm excited to be able to pass it on to them so they can tell you all about their uh, awesome experiences firsthand. Uh, and once again, just a really big thank you to our volunteers for the work they're doing. Um, a big thank you to our partners uh, and obviously to, uh, to Thomas today as well for putting this all together so we have a chance to share these stories with you. Thank you, Katie. Well, those who know me know that I love my job. And one of the reasons I love my job so much is because I get to work with people like the folks you're gonna hear from very shortly who are incredibly passionate about um, being connected in a global world, about doing what we can uh, toward international cooperation and about continuing to learn and to grow in that space as well. So I want to uh, introduce uh, all four and we'll um, sort of transition from one to the other. Um, so Deanne, Vanessa, Christina, and Alana are going to share with you about their recent experience um, through the, the Young Volunteer Program with Vets Without Borders. I'm very excited that they've all been able to be here today. They've had very different experiences um, and I know that you will uh, find a lot of interesting information and I'm sure you'll catch a glimpse of their passion as well as they speak to you. So we'll start with Deanne and then we'll continue on. Um, and here is a glimpse of the Young Volunteer Program. Okay, can I just get confirmation that we can all hear me and see my screen? Great. Yes, can you can hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay. So my name is Deanne, I'm a phase three student at the Ontario Veterinary College. Um, last summer, I volunteered with Vets Without Borders for three months, which I spent in Ghana. So I was in a team of three. There was myself, Cassie and Raiden. Uh, they're vet students from ABC and WCVM. And we were a part of two different projects in Ghana. So we were involved with SEND as well as GAPNET. So to tell you a little bit about SEND, um, this organization is a local NGO that focuses their mission on policy research and advocacy, and they have an overall objective of uplifting economic well-being for communities in poverty. Um, their head office is located in Tamale, which is the northern city of Ghana, and I believe it's the second largest city in Ghana, followed by Accra, which is the capital city. Uh, we spent six weeks there. And it was really, really amazing work. So this organization focuses a lot on gender equality as well. They actually had a gender specialist that was a local staff who came along these trips with us and did her own presentations around gender equality that we got to see. And it was really amazing. So our role there primarily was um, curating presentations on animal welfare and talking about the impact of animal welfare on productivity and therefore economic well-being. So really just getting the point across that if you treat your animals well, if you provide them with good welfare and husbandry, then they're gonna be giving you better productivity, for example, more eggs, more meat to sell, and overall, it'll be a better economic profit for the farmers. Um, we also worked with several translators, which is a really, really fun experience. And it's actually really cool in Ghana. If you drive two hours north or an hour anywhere north, south, east, west, they speak a completely different language. So we got to hear a lot of different languages and work with tons of different translators. And I thought that was a really, really cool aspect of the project. So that was SEND. And then we also spent some time with the, another organization called GAPNET. It's another local NGO. And again, similar mission and values. They focus on food security, economic well-being, and sustainability for rural farmers. Now, so this sorry, so sorry, Jan. Uh, we can't see okay. your screen. Do you want to try sharing one more time? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Thanks. That's okay. Can you see it then? No, we're not getting it. Oh no! This is my biggest nightmare. No. <laughs> You're getting a great story, though. We, we really, I'm really enjoying everything. Um, we just let's see. How about now. We know that's why we tested everything ahead of time, right? Yeah. Is it, mm -hmm. can you see it now? 
Mm -mm. Nope, unfortunately. You know what? I'm going to try and unshare my screen and then try it again. There we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, let's get back to where we were. Everything still good? Great. Yep, perfect. Okay, Thanks cool. So Sorry about that. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Awesome. Okay, keep going. Okay, so the next four months or four weeks we spent with uh, GAFNET. So again, a little, another local NGO, and they focus on food security, economic well being, and sustainability. So really similar uh, mission and values. Now, this place we got to stay was called um, Yua. It's a sweet, really small local village, just like super, super north of Ghana. We were literally steps away from Burkina Faso, which is the country that borders Ghana on the north. Um, amazing, amazing place. Like I, I just love Yua so much. Um, so our role in with Gafna was very similar. So we also did presentations, but this time instead of on animal welfare, we, which we touched upon a little bit, uh, we were more curating presentations for specific husbandry uh, practices. So kind of explaining how to raise your sheep and your goats and your chickens well for the farmers. Um, so it was really awesome. We got to work with translators as well. And we also got to do vaccination campaigns, which is super, super fun. So there were two vaccination campaigns that we held. One was against PPR for sheep and goats. And then one was for Newcastle against poultry. I think we vaccinated around 1200 animals for sheep and goats with PPR. Um, around various communities around Yua and with Newcastle, we vaccinated we vaccinated thousands and thousands of birds, and we actually provided the vaccines to the community animal health workers for them to continue the work after we've left, which is awesome. And to build up on that point, we were also involved in training of community animal health workers. So these community animal health workers, for short, we call them cows. Um, they are a volunteer from each community that decides that they want to represent the community for animal health. So they will be, um, anytime any community members have an issue with your animals, they will come to the cows and the cows will help them by connecting, the, connecting them to the local veterinarians because it is a little bit much harder for the local community members to connect with the veterinarians because limited resources. So they're a great connection and they also have some knowledge on animal husbandry and management as well. So they are able, they're also able to help with that way. And so that was a work with GAPNET. And now the last two weeks in um, Ghana, we got to spend in Accra, which is the capital city. We got to do many, many different fun activities. So our supervisor for GAFNET set this up for us where we have where we would have the last two weeks in Accra to do some fun tourism stuff. So we got to see, you know, we went to a national park. And as you can see, one of the pictures on my slides, yes, that's a baboon on my bed. They kind of they're vicious, I swear to God. They opened the door and like broke into our hotel room and ate all of our food. It was insane. And yeah, just a bunch of really, really fun things. And we also got to tour the veterinary industry in Ghana. Our supervisor, Akuns, he is so well known in Ghana. I swear, anything he wanted to see in Ghana, he would pick up the phone and he would connect those dots. So we wanted to see, for example, a, a zoo vet setting. He called, he called the zoo guy and said, oh, I worked with this guy 40 years ago. And then we got to spend a whole day in a zoo and shadowing the vet. And then he also connected up with various different private, private clinic practice. So we also got to shadow a bunch of different vets doing dogs and cats. And we also got to see poultry barns and the big veterinary lab that they have that you know takes all of their rabies sampling and everything that they do in Ghana that gets sent to this lab. We also got to tour that lab. So that was also really cool. And, and just to wrap up my presentation, I want to tell you guys a little bit about some of the things I loved about this trip, which is endless, so many, so many things. I think one of the first ones and truly the biggest one is just how unique this experience is that you really, really get to get submerged into the culture. I would say that if you want to go to Ghana and visit as a tourist, you can absolutely do that, but you wouldn't have been able to see Ghana the way that you would have here if you went as a tourist. And the connections you make with people there are also incredible. So we had our neighbors that was all of Akuns, our supervisors' um, family, and they were so friendly, so welcoming. And they would invite us over for dinner and teach us how to look or cook local dishes. And we would play card games with them. We would teach them card games from Canada. They would teach us their games and just so incredible. And obviously the food is delicious and it's so different than what we eat here. So it, it was also really amazing to see that. And yeah, just so many things to love about this trip, um, even outside the work. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. 
So thank you for listening. And if you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out and ask. I've left my email on this page or you can even find me on social media and send me a message and I'm super happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, we can see and hear you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Vanessa. Um, I'm a third year vet student um, at OVC. Um, and I was one of the young volunteers that went to uh, Kenya this past summer, along with my partner, Atlanta, um, who's also going to spe be speaking today. Um, but I'm going to share a little bit about where we lived and worked. Um, so yeah. So to start off, um, our project was based in Mukurini in Neri County. Um, Neri is located in the center of Kenya. Um, it's a very mountainous, um, depending on the season, lush and green. Um, but yeah, it is an amazing place to live. Um, as Dan mentioned, um, one of the great things about being a VWB um, volunteer is that you get to live in like a rural um, village in Kenya and then the experiences that you get from that um, and becoming a part of the community um, is something really special. So um, Miri, one of its like main exports is so agriculture. So, so not only uh, dairy farming, but also um, some of the photos I've included here, uh, lots of coffee and tea. Um, so we got the opportunity to not only pick coffee, um, but also to try a lot during our time there. So just a little bit on uh, Kenyan dairy farming. Um, Kenya, so most of the farms there are small smallholder dairy farms, um, which through the VETS program is uh, mainly who we worked with. Um, on average, they have about one to three cows per farm. Um, and a typical farm is roughly half an acre in size. Um, and on that, that includes places for the family to live, uh, the animals to be housed, um, and then uh, places for their crops to be grown and a garden for human consumption. Um, another photo here um, is hand milking is um, how most of the cows are milked. Um, after they're milked, the milk is walked to like a central uh, milk collection station where the farmer's milk is weighed and then sold to the dairy. Um, I've also included some pictures of like a typical cow shed there. So they do practice uh, mostly zero grazing um, for the dairy cows there. Um, and then on the right, Alana is um, putting some napier grass into uh, one of the grass cutters for, um, for the cows. So we worked with the Wakalima Dairy, um, which is located in Mukurini. Um, it's a dairy co-op that collects, pools, and processes milk. So they process the milk into both yogurt and then shelf-stable or refrigerated milk products. Um, the yogurt is very delicious and you get to eat a lot um, if you go there. So VWB um, and Wakalima have a very long-standing partnership. Um, I believe they've been um, working with each other for over a decade. And so one of the great things about being a volunteer there is that through this relationship, um, it just helps, you know, as a volunteer coming in, that transition to be a lot more smoother. Um, they're really open to volunteers coming. They love um, talking to you and collaborating and listening to any suggestions that you may have. Um, and they really want you to understand um, kind of the dairy um, production cycle. And so as a volunteer, we were able to tour the entire dairy. We got to drive in the milk trucks and kind of see how the milk comes right from the farm um, all the way up to um, being processed. So the Wakalima has about uh, 9,000 dairy farmers that they um, collect milk from, and they're receiving right now about 60,000 liters of milk a day. Their goal um, through working with BWB and the Bet VETS project is um, to collect 1,000 liters of milk a day. So one of the main um, roles that we did this summer was through um, our seminars for small scale dairy farmers. Um, so we had groups of farmers that um, we gave seminars to um, on a variety of different topics. These topics were from um, the extension officers at the dairy um, or farmers on areas of 
concern or challenges or things that they wanted to work on. Um, so this summer we focused on One Health. Um, we did mastitis and reproduction, um, cow comfort, and then dry cow management. Um, and so through these, uh, we got to work with a translator. Um, we got to revisit a lot of the groups that we went to, which was really great because we got to have you know, good discussions with them, do case studies, um, and have good like question and answer sessions. Um, so as a volunteer, um, you get a lot of experience public speaking, um, working in large groups, um, but also working one-on-one -on -one with the farmers and kind of listening to them, listening to their challenges, maybe what's working for them, what isn't, um, and also like giving um, suggestions and advice to see if they, it can help them. Another um, one of our roles this summer was working with our community One Health Champions or COHCs. Um, so these are some of our COHCs, uh, Beth and Ruth um, and their group. So COHCs are farmers and members of the community that um, have an interest in One Health, but are also like dedicated to educated, educating and working with their fellow farmers and communities. Um, and so we got to work alongside them closely and form really great relationships with them. Um, I got to actually do a farm stay at Beth there on the Wright's uh, house. Um, and one of the great thing about Wakalima's uh, COHDs are that a majority of them are female. Um, and so one of our, the Kenyan national volunteers that we worked with, um, we got to work with a gender specialist. And so it was really interesting to kind of be a part of and like listen to the conversations about gender and kind of the deep, um, just cultural um, gender issues that are currently like coming up. And so, yeah, the COHCs are part of the like VETS um, project. And so working with them was a really like special part of being a VWB uh, volunteer this summer. Um, so just to wrap up um, on kind of, it was a lot about work and uh, life, but um, being a VWB volunteer, you also get to have a lot of great experiences. Um, so the people you meet, the connections that you build, um, and the friendships that you form, um, we were so fortunate to be able to, um, take some of our time off and travel throughout Kenya and see a lot of, um, different places. Uh, we got to see the great migration and, um, go on several different, um, trips, which was a really, um, awesome opportunity, but also just, um, yeah build like relationships with the Kenya National Volunteers and the people we worked with. So um, I'm definitely biased, but you should um, apply for Kenya. It is an awesome experience and you, yeah, will not regret it. But if you have any questions, um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. That was really amazing. Christina, are you next? Yes, I am. Great. Um, let me just share my screen. There we go. Oh. uh what is everyone able to see <laughs> we see we see the backstage so we see the um uh just kind of the smaller slide and the and this place for the notes okay what there about this okay <laughs> good i'm glad i figured that out okay um okay so hello everyone uh my name's christina uh, so I was also one of the young volunteers here uh, for Veterinarians Without Borders this past summer. Um, I'm a third year student, uh, just like my colleagues at the Ontario Veterinary College here in Guelph, Ontario. Uh, my current interests in veterinary medicine include uh, companion animal medicine, wildlife and exotic medicine as well, um, as well as some global health. Um, so that's why this Young Volunteers program was, I was so keen and happy to participate in it. It's always been like a dream come true pretty much for me. Um, and my placement this past summer was in Cambodia working with AVSF, which Katie introduced a little bit earlier. Um, so a little bit about the organization of AVSF. Uh, so AVSF just basically works to improve the lives of those who are in poverty and those who are basically ne neglected and excluded from their communities. 
Um, so they offer support through various activities, uh, depending on the location that they're in. So some of these activities are related to animal health, um, which is the one that I participated in, but they also do a lot of other work, including agroecology, sustainable and fair supply chains. They work in post-emergency and they also work with climate change. Um, and so throughout the summer, I had the amazing opportunity to work with the main office I worked with was in Cambodia. But as I'll explain a little bit later in my presentation, I actually, by the end of the summer, I also got to work um, and meet some of the people in the AVS offices from Mongolia, Laos, and France, which is a super, super cool opportunity. Um, so my specific role was working as a uh, biosecurity support officer. Um, with AVSF over the summer, and I also had a partner, um, Ines, that worked with me as well. Um, so basically, as a biosecurity support officer, uh, my duties were just to basically gather information on how farming was being done amongst these smallholder farmers across Cambodia and basically provide recommendations on how to improve their production and biosecurity, um, basically using this One Health approach. So for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of One Health, it means to basically understand that environmental health, human health, and animal health um, are all interconnected and they're all very, very important in order to help the production and um, of a farm. So, for example, in this specific context, you know, soil health is super important to ensure healthy plants can grow, which can be used to feed the farm animals, which will in turn be um, consumed by the humans. So basically, if one part of the system is failing, then the whole system will fail. Um, so in Cambodia, this approach was super, super important because many farmers use what's called an integrated farming system. Um, so they had a variety of animals. They had cattle, pigs, uh, chickens, ducks all on one farm, and they also had many different types of plants. So they had rice farming and fruit trees, and this is all on their farm to care for. So it was very, very important for us to be able to go in there and understand like their farming system and understand exactly how we can help increase their production by not allowing one of these aspects to fail, but by prioritizing all of them and using a very like holistic approach to do this. So to gather some of the information, we completed many farm visits. Uh, to understand basically firsthand how these practices were, uh, how firsthand the practices the farmers were currently following and discussing with them like how ABSF can support them. Uh, so you can see on these photos on the left was a meeting with a farmer at their farm. Um, all these times that we met firsthand with these farmers, we had a translator with us, which was a super cool experience. I've never worked with a translator before, um, but it was really, really eye-opening to be able to see where the farmers lived and see their day-to-day -day work and really how hard they're working every single day. Uh, the middle picture shows myself and my colleagues uh, on the right, and then some farmers on the left, and we got to, again, meet these farmers, tour their farm, understand exactly like what they're most proud of in their farm and what they exactly need help with. And again, that was a super eye-opening experience. They're all such kind people and resilient people. Uh, and then on the right picture shows a farmer caring for one of her cattle, and she has her little dog next to her, which is very cute. Uh, so after we gathered, um, all of this information from going to farm visits. We were also interviewing some professionals uh, within Cambodia itself. So we met with multiple researchers to basically understand the farming system in Cambodia um, and to discuss their work with different prevalence of diseases. So we met with someone that worked very much uh, a lot with rabies. And so this kind of networking allowed us to use many different types of resources that they provided us. Um, we got to meet with some researchers in a, that research these kinds of things in a totally different context across the world, which was super interesting. And it also allowed AVSF itself to make further connections um, and help develop their work in that part of the world too. So that was very cool. All these researchers were very open uh, to helping us out and were very, very interested in our work. So in the end, after discussing with both the farmers themselves and discussing with these researchers, we were able to come up with some recommendations to help improve the production on these farms and decrease the disease uh, rate. So uh, one rep recommendation, for example, was to be able to create 
um, a standard quarantine and isolation procedure for these farms. Um, it was this is super important in this a lot of these farmers weren't necessarily super familiar with the concept of some subclinical disease, which is basic, basically a disease that can spread with no clinical signs. So it was very important to be able to inform these farmers that if they get a new animal onto their farm, or if they have a sick animal, they must take, they must quarantine that animal or isolate it for a certain amount of time to make sure when they introduce that animal to the rest of their herd um, or the rest of their group that they're no longer spreading the disease. And this will help increase their production. So by the end of the summer, everybody really, really understood this and understood this concept and was ready to pass that on to the farmers. So it was very, very rewarding in the end of it. Um, and then after we gathered all our information, made our recommendations, we were able to um, write about various recommendations for these smallholder farmers in Cambodia, and we conducted both a training session with the AVSF uh, Cambodian colleagues and the ones that I made friends with. We were able to conduct a training session with them to explain these recommendations so that afterwards when we leave, they can go out and explain all these recommendations to the farmers themselves. So it makes for a very sustainable approach, which was great. Um, as well, we presented at an international workshop um, with those working for ABSF worldwide to share our knowledge and our work. So we had people over from Mongolia, Laos, and France, and our Cambodian colleagues all together, um, sharing their knowledge of One Health, sharing their projects that they're doing in all these different countries, um, which was super amazing to work with. It was great to see like what kind of projects are done in these parts of the world. Um, and it was just, it was a very, very eye-opening and a very rewarding experience. And so I learned uh, lessons both professionally and personally through this experience. Um, so while living out in Cambodia, some professional lessons that I've learned is I learned a lot more about the One Health approach and how that can be integrated in a variety of systems worldwide using different kinds of resources. Obviously out there, they don't have the same farming systems or the same resources that we would have over here. So it was really cool to be able to take my knowledge that I've learned from vet school here and apply it to a completely different scenario. Uh, it was a challenge, but I made it through and it was super rewarding. Uh, and I also love to um, understand how I can present information and bring people together from multiple different cultures, multiple different backgrounds, um, especially at the end through our international workshop. A lot of these people, English wasn't their first language. It was either their second, their third, their fourth language. So it was very, very interesting and a really cool learning opportunity to be able to develop and create some type of activity that all these people can come together and work hands on together and everybody can contribute to this idea of One Health, even if um, people don't necessarily speak the same language. And personally, I took a lot away from the experience in this country. Um, I'm really, really impressed with how resilient this kind of culture is and their kindness. Um, it's a country that uses very much a collectivist approach, um, then they're always looking out for one another. Um, for example, I always love to tell my story about the mangoes. Like it was, I was just a day in the office and I just casually mentioned that I like mangoes and they took that and they went outside and they went to the nearest mango tree. They picked me a mango, they cut it up and they gave it to me. And they're like, here, you like, you said you like mangoes. And that's just not something that I get back here in Canada. So I'm really trying to bring these lessons back into Canada, into my own life and show others that same level of kindness. Um, and yeah, that's it for my presentation about Cambodia. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to chat further about it. But overall, it was an amazing opportunity and I highly recommend it to anybody. Thank you, Christina. Uh, just before we hear from Alana, I'd like to just remind everyone that we will have a chance for, for questions and answers. So if you'd like to write any questions that are bouncing around in your mind, um, you can put them into the comments and we'll we'll address those at that time. Over to you, Alana. Okay, thanks everyone so far. Um, 
just to confirm, can everybody hear me and see my screen okay? We can see and hear you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, so my name is uh, Lana Dudich. I'm also a third year student. Uh, I go to school at the WCVM uh, in Saskatoon. I'm originally from Manitoba, uh, from a farm here. So yeah, my interests are at this point, mostly large animal and food, uh, animal medicine, but yeah, I'm open to mixed as well. Uh, but yeah, like Vanessa mentioned, uh, I was in Kenya this summer with her. Um, yeah, and she gave a really nice introduction. So I was just going to uh, share a little bit more about some of our uh, specific uh, experiences that we had. Yeah, a Vets Without Borders trip was something that I've wanted to do for a very long time, uh, long before even getting into vet school. So I feel very grateful that I was able to have this experience uh, and I highly recommend it to uh, anybody who's thinking about it. So yeah, this is us uh, just at the dairy co-op, the Wakalima uh, that Vanessa mentioned. Uh, so this was probably uh, one of the highlights for I'd say Vanessa and I this summer. Uh, this is a farm um, uh, that we worked with. This is Margaret uh, in the middle. We uh, actually ended up building a calf shed for uh, her and working together with her to build that. So like Vanessa said, uh, most of our work that we did this summer uh, was sharing seminars uh, on mastitis and One Health and whatnot. Uh, Margaret, she has been attending uh, some of our seminars. Um, and yes, yeah, so we visited her farm uh, and we noticed that kind of the biggest limiting factor, uh, I'd say for her um, and her farm was that she or her cows outgrew her calf shed. So she had two cows uh, and this calf here. Um, but didn't have enough space for them all. So it's really challenging to fix a mastitis problem uh, when you don't have enough space for cows to lie down. Uh, so with discussions and whatnot, and just hearing a little bit about uh, her story, uh, our group decided that we would uh, work together and build her a calf shed uh, so that, yeah, her calf would have space and then her two cows uh, would each have their own stall. Yeah, so this was the beginning uh, where we figured the best place would be to put that calf shed. <laughs> and this was uh, just building or uh, the process of building it. It was really, it was a really good experience just seeing how things are built there and sourcing the materials. We have to give a lot of credit to our national volunteers, especially Kamau. Uh, they're very resourceful when it comes to uh, using the tools and the materials that we have. Uh, available to us and even just finding shavings and whatnot. Uh, it was all really interesting. Uh, so this was our final product. Um, yeah, we saw or we made sure it had a roof and that had an elevated uh, floor and whatnot. Uh, and we yeah, managed to find shavings. And this was our crew. Yeah, and these were the two cow stalls. Um, afterwards, so the calf was originally staying in one of these stalls and the two cows had to share the uh, one other stall. Uh, and this was our whole group. So on the right hand side, we have Maureen. She's uh, a gender specialist, national volunteer that was working with us. Uh, and then next to her is Kamau. He's an animal nutritionist that was part of our team. Uh, Vanessa, and then Margaret, and then Daisy. She's a veterinarian national volunteer that was also part of our team. And then we have Frida, um, which was one of Margaret's friends and neighbors who's also been really involved with veterinarians uh, without borders uh, and the seminars and whatnot. So um, when we went and visited Margaret's farm about three or four weeks later, uh, just to check in and see how the cows and calf is settling into their new spaces, uh, it ended up being really positive. Uh, her one cow that is currently milking uh, when we originally visited her farm, she was getting about three to four liters of milk uh, a day. But after uh, we visited her, um, after making those changes, we learned that the cow's um, milk has increased, production has increased to about uh, seven liters. So nearly doubled in just a span of a few weeks. So yeah, that was really encouraging. And Margaret was uh, really happy. And it was also um, now a lot easier for her to keep the stalls clean because um, we made sure they were the right size and whatnot. So 
yeah, it was really encouraging. It was really uh, fun to work with her and get to know her family and her story a little bit. So I'd say that was one of the highlights for us. Um, another um, opportunity that we got that actually our supervisor, Shauna, was able to uh, organize for us um, kind of outside of our uh, dairy work um, that we were mostly doing. Uh, we had the opportunity to work with and uh, partner with Vets Without Borders Germany. They were doing uh, uh, rabies vaccine campaigns for dogs in another county. So Vanessa and I were fortunate enough to be able to spend a few days with uh, them. So yeah, we each uh, spent one day vaccinating dogs at these campaigns. I think we each vaccinated about 50 um, when we were there. So yeah, I can't guarantee that this is an opportunity that um, would always happen in Kenya, but just to note to, yeah, keep an open mind and you never know uh, what kind of opportunities may come along. Um, and just in general, when you're doing a trip like this, uh, it's really good to keep an open mind. But yeah, it was really good. We got to see a different part of Kenya. Um, yeah, and just uh, a bit of different medicine with dogs rather than um, dairy cows. But yeah, overall, it was really good. Um, yeah, and like the other girls have said, um, a really big part of it is making the connections um, with, yeah, the locals and national volunteers. So we were really well taken care of in Kenya. That's without borders, really makes, makes sure that you're safe and comfortable. So on the uh, left-hand side here, we have um, our driver, Ephraim. He yeah, picked us up from our uh, where we stayed every day and drove us to work and to the different farms. He's been working with uh, Vets Without Borders for several years. So he knew kind of the project well and yeah, our safety was his number one priority. Um, and it was really great to get to know him as well. Uh, and it made us feel very safe um, knowing that we had him um, and our cook, Samuel. Um, he also took care of us, uh, him as well, has been working with Vets Without Borders volunteers for a long time and really made sure we were well fed. Um, these are just some of the meals that uh, he made for us. So yeah, our accommodations and whatnot were all uh, really good. good. And yeah, also like Vanessa said, um, yeah, we were fortunate enough to spend a lot of time exploring Kenya. I'd say our weekdays were pretty busy. Um, for the most part, we had full days from Monday to Friday, but our weekends were pretty flexible. We were able to yeah, do a couple safaris. These are the great migration pictures in the top left. We also did some hiking and uh, a camping trip. We got to see the uh, coast as well for a weekend. Um, and this is a tea farm, tea farm tour uh, that we did as well. But yeah, there's lots to see. It's a very beautiful country. And yeah, just to wrap up and yeah, to also echo what the others said, um, probably, yeah, the biggest highlight for me was just all the people and the connections you make, um, both in Kenya, but now also across Canada with the other volunteers. Um, I think we've made some lifelong friendships and yeah, connections that I think will last a lifetime. So. I really encourage, um, yeah, if you have the opportunity to do this, uh, I would say to take that opportunity. And that concludes uh, my presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Alana. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Diane. Great to hear more about your experience in the field. Um, we do have a, a little bit of time for some question and answer. If anybody has any questions, I don't see any in the chat, but you can also uh, raise your hand. I know that those were some pretty thorough presentations. So perhaps all of your questions were answered. Um, if you do have any questions, um, you're welcome to ask those now. Well, we're waiting. I know those were, were really thorough and really amazing. And I love Alana that at the end you had like anecdotes and stuff. That was really great because it's all about, you know, there, there's so many little things I'm sure you guys could, would love to share, but um, yeah, those experience, those mini experiences is really, really, really special. Thank you so much for sharing them. Um, 
so uh, here's a question from Dale uh, for, for anyone that wants to answer. How did you feel giving advice to clients who were older and local, uh, given being young foreigners? And um, yeah, how, how did anyone wants to address that? Dan, we haven't heard from you for a bit. I can, yeah, definitely answer this question. So that's a that's a great question and definitely sorry, let me turn the video on. That's a great question and definitely something that you know we were all considering, especially during our pre-departure training. So you get a week in Ottawa with all the volunteers and you do a lot of different trainings to prepare you for this trip. And definitely something that you think about. But from from my experience personally, I didn't run into too much trouble with that. Everyone was very nice and very welcoming and very eager to, to hear what you have to say. And they they trust you because you're also working with your the local NGO that kind of like introduces you to them. And you're also working with a veterinary supervisor. And for my two supervisors, they were also Ghanaian. One of them was actually Ghanaian Canadian OVC grad. Um, but yeah, I personally didn't run into any issues be just because we we had such a big connection with the local NGO and the local supervisors. Well, anyone else? How was your experience? Vanessa, did you find anything um, particularly challenging there? Was it also like a overwhelm overwhelmingly positive? No, I would like echo what Deanna said. Um, and that, yeah, because you are, I mean, we were typically younger than most of the people um, who we were giving advice to, but they do really value your advice. Um, but it's also a great like skill that we found. Um, sometimes we had to like have hard conversations, but um, it was a good skill to like learn how to kind of like give them like straightforward advice and not beat around the bush. So I think that was something that we kind of reflected on at the end of our experience um, in Kenya was that we were able to like communicate directly instead of um, adding a lot of like fluff on top. So um, yeah, it's good skill building. Great. Thomas, here's some questions for you. Um, uh, people are wondering if they can apply for volunteering programs offered by VSF, even though if, if they're not Canadian, particularly this uh, person's from Germany, and um, if there are volunteering programs related with research at all, or is it just um, veterinary work? Mm, yeah, good questions. Thank you for asking those. Um, so this program in particular is funded by Global Affairs Canada. Um, so it is one of the requirements uh, for the VETS volunteer program is uh, that you are a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Uh, we do have other opportunities through Veterinarians Without Borders to volunteer. Um, so we have our Ukraine response um, in Canada. We also work in Northern Canada as well. Um, so there are opportunities, but for our international uh, vets program, uh, being a Canadian citizen is a is a requirement there. And we do offer a, a variety of different volunteer opportunities. Um, you don't have to be uh, a vet or a vet tech um, to to volunteer with VWB. We also have communications roles, uh, research roles come up, monitoring and evaluation roles. Um, so there's, there's a variety of things, and, and these are, are very much driven by our partner organizations as we work with them, determine what, uh, what would work best um, to help strengthen their own capacity in their local contexts, and then we work uh, together with them to recruit the right, uh, the right folks for the right job. So um, yeah, good, uh, good questions. And there is a question there I see about the application process as well. Um, the, we, we do have an application process through our online uh, portal. So if you go to vetswithoutborders.ca slash volunteers, you'll find our opportunities there. And um, I'm always happy to chat as well uh, with anyone who's interested in volunteering with us. Yeah, some of the other volunteer opportunities uh, we have sent recently a couple of vets from the US over to Romania, we, where we work with Save the Dogs. Um, they're really close to the Ukrainian border, so they've been helping with that. Um, and yeah, it's it, there's lots of amazing opportunities. And if you ever if you don't see what you're looking for, don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, because you know, if, if even if it's not with our organization, we're really connected with lots of organizations that are looking for those kinds of things. So we're happy to put you in touch. Um, and let you know if there's anything upcoming. Always good to get in touch earlier, the better, because it's great to have uh, to have that set up for the future. Um, Thomas, another question is, I know everyone here has been third year uh, students. Is, do you have to be a third year student to volunteer? 
you don't have to be a third year student to volunteer. Um, we do take into consideration the mandate of the position, um, what the skills are of the volunteer who's applying for the particular role. Um, so we do have folks who have graduated from their vet program and are going on to, to volunteer through the young volunteer program specifically. But then we also have our general stream of volunteers uh, through our Vets International program. Um, and those are, are a variety of different uh, folks from different backgrounds and skills, including animal health, but also more broadly. And how soon after entering vet school can you apply? Can you apply right after your first year? Um, we do, we do um, really strive to um, place uh, volunteers who can offer some skills in whatever context they're going. Uh, we also do um, work with our partners to make sure that each volunteer position is helping to strengthen their own capacity toward their own goals in, in whatever way that is. Um, so typically we, we do not place um, early on uh, in the process of vet school, but we can. Depends on the role. It depends on um, the, yeah, the needs of the partner. So there are some factors. So if you are interested in volunteering, feel free to reach out and we're happy to, to discuss with you what options might be a good fit. Great. One of the questions I got when we, we were uh, posted on Reddit to talk about things, uh, um, and I think you guys touched on this a little bit um, about how amazing the food is, but some people have dietary restrictions. Can anyone speak to how that, if any of you are vegan or vegetarian, um, if you kind of had to switch it up a little because of what was offered or um, anything? I know, Christina, do you want to, we haven't heard from you in a bit. How was how was that? Are you a vegetarian, or did you kind of change up change up their diet? Uh, hi. So I apparently I can't share my video anymore for some okay. reason, but uh, it says the host disabled it. But that's okay. I can speak to that anyways. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, so I'm not ve uh, vegetarian or vegan myself. Um, but in Cambodia, it was the places that we were in um, were more of like city-like. So a lot of the places that we were able to go, like uh, they did have like vegetarian and vegan options, like depending on where you went, you just have to be careful with like more of like the street foods and things like that. But um, most of the restaurants like had some, they may not have much, but like it wasn't so much like of a concern I would say over there or an issue but again I wasn't vegetarian or vegan so <laughs> maybe somebody else who is I can speak to that but I didn't see too too much of an issue and the food in Cambodia was absolutely absolutely delicious so there's a question um about Cambodia that just popped up um given the predominance of Buddhism over there did the topic of euthanasia ever come up and was it difficult to reconcile um, versus local concepts of animal welfare, welfare and euthanasia. Did that ever come up? That never actually came up so much just because um, like we were working more with like farmers and farm animals mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't necessarily in like a small animal context where you would get like a huge I find in small animals like a lot more of like it, the animal euthanasia talk, whereas mm -hmm. because we were working more with farmers, it, the talk of that particular topic didn't necessarily come up, if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. I actually have an experience with that that I could share, if that's okay. Yeah. Be yeah, because the last two weeks we spent in Accra um, and we, we kind of volunteered out of several different like private practices, so with small animals. Um, so that did come up. We, we came across a 12-year-old German Shepherd that was really, really sick, really skinny, anorexic, just looked like it was definitely a euthanasia case from Western standards. Um, we discussed that with the veterinarian and asked him if that was something that he would consider bringing up to the owner. And he actually told us no, because in Ghana, you people don't generally euthanize their animals, just, just how the, the way the culture is. Um, so taking that, the three of us, definitely really difficult to hear and see, especially seeing a really sick animal that we think needs to be euthanized, but you know, their culture doesn't really practice that. But I think at the end of the day, you have to realize you're you're in their culture and you know it's it's difficult, but like what else could you do? You just have to accept it because you are in their culture and you're not you're not there to change their culture or to try to convince them otherwise. You just kind of nod your head and you understand and you you move on. So I don't know if that answers it really well, but 
yeah, just it's hard to accept, but you, you do because you're in a different culture. Mm -hmm. I could say like one more thing too, about that is that also in Cambodia, it was, there was, they didn't necessarily have a lot of pets. So it wasn't necessarily, it was a lot of like stray dogs and cats, um, because they just don't necessarily like have the money over there to give the care to pets. So instead you would just see the animals run around and like kind of fend for themselves. So I feel like that was also like a huge difference and like a huge adjustment mean like coming over from Canada and obviously people absolutely adore their pets over here. Right. So going over there and seeing stray dogs and cats running around all over the place, some of them aren't in the best condition, um, being starved. Sometimes you can see their ribs, super, super skinny. Um, but like Dan said, like that's kind of their culture and that's their country. So that's not necessarily like my place to say anything, but that was something that I did have to adjust to, uh, going over there. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think anybody that's traveled has, has seen that it's a, it's a different wherever you travel and, um, everyone's at different stage of, of how they treat animals often, you know, or where the animal welfare standards are culturally. So I think um, anyone that's open to travel, I hope you're open to, to knowing that, you know, it, it, it's all, it's all part of a, part of a bigger picture. And that's uh, 10 o'clock for, oh, yeah. sorry, Pacific standard time, but that's one hour <laughs> here. Uh, Thomas, any final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christina, for offering those thoughts. Um, thank you to our panelists, Christina, Diane, Vanessa, Alana. Uh, it's great to hear about your experience. Um, thank you for sharing it with everyone. I hope it was beneficial to those of you who joined us to hear about the Young Volunteer Program, to learn a little bit more about Vets Without Borders. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come and spend this, this hour with us. And if you are interested in volunteering, there are lots of volunteer opportunities on our website, so check it out. Um, go to vetswithoutborders.ca slash volunteers. You'll see not only the Young Volunteer Program is recruiting right now, but also uh, other positions are available as well. We would love to hear from you. Um, so once again, thank you for being part of this webinar, and uh, we hope to connect with you in the future. Thanks, everyone.